प्लीज गो है सर अच्छा बट देन विल हैव टू सॉर्ट इट फॉर कैन यू सी माय स्लाइड्स सर इट सेस स्टार्टेड शेयरिंग बट वी स्टिल कांट सी द स्लाइड्स येट यू कांट सी द स्लाइड्स नाउ वी कैन सर डिस्कशन <laughs> Are my slides visible now? Uh, yes, sir. It's visible, sir. But you have to put the full screen. Yeah, I'm just trying to do that. But I think this is. Hey, Panchu, it's eight o'clock. You can uh, start once you are ready. Yeah, sir, we can see your slides. Screen, you can see. Yeah, 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 we can, we can. Okay, I'll just stop sharing. Yeah. thank you so shall we start now lanka yes please go on all right uh, good evening everyone on behalf of uc uh, governing council and uc ocular can you go on the uh, slide show mode please yeah. with your presentation uc and uc ocular emergency team i would like to welcome you all uh, for this wonderful colorful webinar code red holy uh this was uh, designed by keeping in mind that since uh, holi is approaching and when we think of holi uh, it a lot of joy and happiness comes to our mind but on the contrary if we uh, look at the downside of it uh, sometimes a lot of times we come across a lot of patients who get severely damaged due to poorly used chemicals or holi colors so with this background in mind i would like to introduce further uh, so this is our uc ocular emergency team which is a wonderful team of comprises of dr arthi heda dr kaushik tripathi dr prasanna and dr anujit paul and myself and under the able guidance of uh, uh, uc governing council we have been able to uh, carry out this series uh, uc ocular emergency uh, where we release short videos of 4 to 5 minutes wherein all the uh, residents or fellows can uh come across or uh, an ocular em emergency and they can go through it while managing it one sec dibanshu one second not moving for the yeah okay so uh, we started 6 months back and every month we release two videos so far we have co covered central retinal artery occlusion acute angle closure glaucoma chemical injuries six nerve palsy lesion due glaucoma post cataract surgery end of orbital cellulitis in a short flexible optic optic neuropathy traumatic hyphema acute viral conjunctivitis corneal tear management acute retrocystitis and last of the series was central retinal vein occlusion uh 6 months back uh, during diwali time we had organized a similar webinar now we are here with this wonderful webinar on holi uh, i'll be introducing uh, as uh, esteemed speaker first uh, uh, so your screen is not visible can you just reshare it i'll i'll share it from my side yeah okay yeah yes deepan sir one second this is done yeah yeah so first up i i would like to invite our esteemed speaker dr rishi swarup sir 
सर इज कंसल्टेंट एंड मेडिकल डायरेक्टर एट स्वरूप आई सेंटर हैदराबाद सर हैज डन हिज एम बी बी एस फ्रॉम कस्तूरबा मेडिकल कॉलेज मनीपाल फॉलोड बाई हिज स्पेशलाइजेशन इन ऑफ्थलमोलॉजी इन फ्रॉम सी एम सी वेल्लोर एंड सर हैज डन हिज लॉन्ग टर्म कॉर्निया फेलोशिप फ्रॉम शंकर नेत्रालय चेन्नई एंड फॉलोड बाय दैट ही हेज ऑल्सो डन एफ आर सी एस इन टू थाउजेंड सिक्स सर इज ऑल्सो चेयरमैन साइंटिफिक कमेटी ऑफ तेलंगाना ऑफथलमिक सोसाइटी पास्ट ऑनर सेक्रेटरी ऑफ हैदराबाद ऑफथलमोलॉजी एसोसिएशन एंड पास्ट चेयरमैन ऑफ ए आर सी एंड तेलंगाना ऑफथलमिक सोसाइटी एंड एडिटोरियल बोर्ड मेबर ऑफ आई जी ओ sir has various awards to his credits that is he has uh, have received various achievements award especially from aao in ii uh, indian uh, refractive surgery society where he has received gold medal in new delhi also sir has given mm joshi oration award and dr o gopal krishna lecture sir special academic interest lies in lamellar corneal surgery and non academic interest are his nature lover fitness enthusiast and amateur photographer uh, we welcome you sir next i would like to invite can you go to the next one our yo panel we have very dynamic yo panel with us dr aditya pradhan he is a consultant cornea and external disease and cataract surgeon at disha eye hospital kolkata then we have dr pranesh ravi who has who is a pass out from shankar netralay chennai and he is a cornea consultant at uh, eye foundation polachi uh, so he is also uh, the founding editor of snippets which he has started during his fellowship and he has published and presented in many state and national for forums and he is also the part of moderation team of the noinadi uc case presentation competition next up we have dr nikun stan uh, he is from indore and he is a very dynamic surgeon in indore who is uh, he is also an ex consultant from rio sitapur he, pre he has presented various papers and surgical videos at national and international forums he is the chief editor of youtube uh, channel that is video assisted surgical teaching and assistant editor of the youtube that is the official youtube channel of the uc he is associate editor at the global journal of cataract surgery and research in ophthalmology and he has special interest lies in challenging complex uh, cataract surgeries and iris repair surgeries and lamellar corneal transplants next we have uh, very dynamic dr sindhuja murugeshan she is currently work working as a consultant in orbit and oculoplasty in arvind hospital coimbatore and has completed phyco in oculoplasty and has been uh, she has received various awards in ais 2022 uh, my co moderator dr prasanna i think he also need, he needs no introduction he is a very dynamic young glaucoma surgeon uh, he is practicing at mahatme eye hospital and i, I am working in indore as con consultant vitro retina services at choitra netralaya indore next we have two case presenters one is dr uh, arnab singh saraya he is a fellow at shankar uh, dr agrawal's eye hospital chennai in the cornea and refractive surgery services and next we have dr krutika thorat she is a third year resident in department of ophthalmology at mahatma gandhi medical college indore first i would like to request dr rishi swarup sir to uh, go ahead with his talk so can you please share your screen yeah hi uh, hi guys uh, at the outset i like to thank uc and especially dr arti eda for reaching out to me and uh, involving me in this it's really nice to uh, interact with mm. the younger lot <laughs> i feel a lot older now looking at all of you so uh, my topic is uh, i modified the topic a little bit because in 20 minutes you can't really cover the entire ocular surface from a to z so i'm going to cover ocular surface chemical injuries which is i think relevant to holy and i'll try to uh, cover most of the important points uh, which we can kind of uh, discuss at any point we can stop and if you have any clarification i'll be happy to share so i'll just get started with my presentation i hope you can see the slides yes sir yeah all right so management of ocular surface chemical injuries a to z when we talk about um, ocular Uh, emergencies i think this is one of the few mm. true ocular emergencies we really have very limited uh, true ocular emergencies uh, in our su sub specialty uh, luckily and uh, this is one of them it usually affects younger people uh, two thirds have been shown to be in younger males and two thirds are at uh, workplace rather than at home and two thirds are caused by alkali versus acid alkali is we know is the more dangerous of the chemicals in india um commonest are firecracker injuries lime injuries and holy colors and holy is coming up and that's why you've called this uh, particular theme code red 
so when we talk about holy colors uh, we know that we have uh, organic colors are uh, becoming very popular lately and that's basically because the original colors which we used to use in holi were uh, largely chemicals and um, you can see the whole list here so many of them are acidic and many of them are alkaline in addition to that they have several other properties which can cause a lot of uh, toxicity to the skin and ocular surface so um, uh, especially uh, the ones which are having a lot of impurities are the ones that can cause a lot of damage and um, many of them are unregulated so i think especially from our point of view it's generally good to encourage uh, people to use organic colors rather than non organic and um, something which has uh, which is uh, from a trusted manufacturer other than that we have lots of uh, common substances which we use uh, in our day to day life which are made of alkali or acid ammonia is something which is present in fertilizers refrigerants cleaning solutions one of the most common alkali which can cause ocular injury lye in drain cleaners potassium hydroxide which is caustic potash uh, sodium uh, magnesium hydroxide is present in sparklers uh, lime is one of the most common ones in india which is mm -hmm. present in uh, pan masala chuna plaster mortar cement whitewash that people do for their homes and it comes in a plastic packet and many times when they are opening the plastic that uh, bursts and the powder is released into the air and can fall into the ocular congenital cul cul sac Uh, common acids that we are we are using are sulfuric acid present in car batteries, fertilizers, uh, and uh, used in refineries for refining petroleum, etc. Dyes have sulfuric acid. Uh, nitric acid is uh, again uh, commonly used in uh, explosives, fertilizers, production of nylon, etc. So it's commonly used in industry. Uh, chromic acid uh, is used in electroplating, uh, uh, ceramic glazes, wood preservation, and uh, Hydrofluoric acid is a milder acid, uh, which is present in etching, glass, semiconductor production, dust removal. So, alkylating agents have both hydrophilic and lipophilic properties because of which they can introduce enter into the cells uh, and uh, cell membranes and anterior chamber very quickly, and that is why they are more dangerous than acid. Uh, they cause a lot of intraocular uh, Uh, effects as well as uh, like as well like inflammation and raised intraocular pressure. Uh, it causes saponification of cell membranes and cell membrane damage, along with disruption of the extracellular matrix. And the cations react with the carboxyl group of the stromal collagen glycosaminoglycans, which is the uh, main cause for the uh, op opacification of the stroma and the ground glass appearance that you see in these cases. acids they tend to cause less damage as they form a like a a, a bar barrier they coagulate on the surface and they don't penetrate further so more of the damage is superficial unless you have a lot of acid exposure so very rarely you will have uh, very severe intraocular effects from acid injuries it's more of a surface damage and that is why uh, more of the acid uh, injuries can be salvaged with uh, surface surgeries etc Uh, with reasonably good outcomes with the newer surgical options that are available now classically the grad grading of chemical mm -hmm. injuries was with roper hall classification which is really a very old classification of more than 50 years and uh, at that time the management options were very limited and this had relevance at some point but now with a lot of new stem cell procedures being available the uh, prognostic prognosis even for say Grade three or grade four injuries is not as bad as it used to be, and uh, I think this has lost relevance to some extent. The newer classification by proposed by Dua, which again is more than twenty twenty five years old, uh, is probably a little more relevant because that is based on the ocular surface status, and it is not a one time classification done at presentation, but it can be revised on a daily basis. When you talk about the stages of chemical injuries, you have acute stage, which is the immediate. Um, state after the chemical injury up to one week and the early repair stage which is one to three weeks and then the late stage which has more of the effects of the sequelae after three weeks vision restoration uh, following chemical injury requires aggressive management not just in the acute phase but also in the late phases the acute phases the principle is very simple you want to neutralize the, the ph so that there's no more 
damage to the ocular surface and intraocular structures because of the acid or alkali. You want the surface to heal, so you want to promote epithelial regrowth at all costs, and you want to re reduce the inflammation and reduce the vascularization. And if there is ischemia, you want blood vessels to reach the uh, surface of the eye so that there is no ischemic damage to the ocular structure. So these are the principles of management in the acute stage. So for that, you will do everything like washing the ocular surface with either uh, ringer lactate or balanced salt solution or buffered solutions like phosphate buffer solution, whatever you can get. If you don't have anything, even tap water is okay in the initial stages, although you want to use a sterile solution as far as possible to minimize chance of infections. Uh, if the source of uh, the chemical injury is some sort of a particulate matter like uh, chuna or lime, you want to make sure that you examine the furnaces and remove uh, um, the entire chemical or even holy color for that matter. Uh, so if you are going to be seeing these patients in your clinic, make sure that you avert the tassel and lids and make sure there's nothing lodged in the superior and inferior furnaces uh, or uh, dam deposited against the tassel conjunctiva. So you may have to do a double reversion and good uh, irrigation of the furnaces. Sometimes you have to run fluid, one or two bottles of whatever fluid you have got in the emergency clinic. If the patient is wearing a contact lens, it's a good idea to remove the contact lens because that also can absorb the chemical. Many people who have a refractive error play wholly with contact lenses and we may not realize and we may just be managing them. But if you don't take out the contact lens, that also can cause damage. So this is just a graph showing how if you just use normal saline, uh, your uh, at different flow rates, your pH will become better, but it won't really reach neutral for a very long period of time. So it's important if you have access to buffered solutions, uh, those will be uh, much useful, especially phosphate buffer solution uh, will be good. And um, uh, ideally all um, emergency uh, rooms should have that. Uh, medical therapy is, uh, once you've done the initial management, you then you examine that. I don't sit to do a detailed examination at the beginning. Once you know that the patient has had a chemical injury, even if you don't see the, the patient on slit lamp, first wash the eye. If they have not had an initial wash at their place where the injury was sustained or somewhere in between. Uh, after you have done that, examine the eye. Try to do a grading of the ocular uh, chemical injury. Uh, examine not just the ocular surface, but also the tarsal conjunctiva. Look for any tarsal conjunctival defects. Look for ischemia um, and uh, what is the status of the limbus. Um, topical steroids have a very important role in the first uh, in the acute stage because they cut down the inflammation, especially in uh, alkali injuries. So you can give them very frequently for the first week. And after that, um, if the surface has epithelized, you can continue steroids. But if the surface is not epithelized, then you have to do something to mm -hmm. epithelize it, like putting a membrane amniotic membrane or whatever. But if you don't have that, then it may be not a good idea to continue steroids beyond the first week because then they can start causing melt of the stroma. Uh, if the surface has been covered with epithelium or amniotic membrane, then you can continue steroids and taper them over three to four weeks. Uh, lubricants have to be used very frequently, preferably hourly or half hourly. And preservative, anytime you're dosing any lubricant frequently, go for either a preservative-free lubricant or something which has a mild preservative uh, like stabilized oxychloro complex. Avoid detergent preservatives like benzalkonium chloride or polyquad. So if you <clears throat> like cysteine family of lubricants, they have polyquad. You won't want to dose them every hourly. Uh, oral vitamin C uh, is a very good um, idea because it helps in promoting epithelization. Uh, two grams per day is the recommended dosing. Oral doxycycline can be used um, uh, to prevent uh, melting. It's, this is more. This has more of a role after the first week because that's when the uh, stromal lysis starts. And uh, of course, a short course of uh, steroids is a good idea per week uh, um, if the epithelium is not healed until then. Uh, in addition to promote epithelization, you can use measures like using a bandage contact lens, but you have to be careful of secondary infections. So if you're putting a BCL, an anti prophylactic antibiotic is a good idea. As it is because you have a compromised ocular surface, it's a good idea to put a low-dose uh, prophylactic antibiotic. Amniotic membrane transplantation does have a very good role. It has two main um, uh, benefits. One is it quickly covers the surface. So uh, the chance of stromal melting becomes significantly lesser. 
the second advantage is once you put an amniotic membrane it kind of uh, helps to kind of maintain that potential space between the epithelium and the squamous membrane stroma so later if you need to do a stem cell transplant the panus peels off very nicely otherwise you get a lot of fibrosis and scarring and when you're trying to dissect the panus the surface becomes very um, bad and um, you may have like an irregular bed on, over which you may have to put your stem cells and that will compromise the final outcome of your uh, limbal epithelial surgeries. Uh, if the um, uh, eye is not healing, the epithelium is not healing, there is a role for using autologous serum and plasma, but uh, it's not easy to come by. If there is ischemia, a significant amount of ischemia around the limbus and uh, this is, uh, you're seeing a lot of pale area without vasculature, then you have to uh, kind of provide blood supply to the limbus and a good way to do it to do this is by advancing tenons to the limbus which is called tenonoplasty so you basically um, resect the unhealthy tenons and once mm -hmm. the edge starts bleeding you mobilize that and suture it to the limbus mm -hmm. so amniotic membrane graft is available uh, as cryopreserved or you can get um, dehydrated amniotic membrane which is available easily or fresh amniotic membrane can also be used whatever uh, works, uh, fresh or cryopreserved is uh, better than the dehydrated form. Uh, basically, it contains a lot of uh, factors, anti-inflammatory and anti-angenic factors, uh, which help uh, in promoting healing and reducing inflammation. So this is just uh, how the amniotic membrane comes in a petri dish or filter paper. Uh, you can use it as a monolayer or multilayer, or you can use a uh, a double layer, so you can do an inlay graft first and then an onlay graft, and it can be combined with tarsal if needed. You can use sutures or you can use fibrin glue, as is being shown in this particular video. This is just a video running past, so this is an acute chemical injury, and we're just doing uh, first uh, an inlay graft over the epithelial defect. Uh, you can use fibrin glue for the inlay graft also. In this case, I'm using sutures, and then over that. Mm -hmm. After you buried the knot. So the sutures should always be parallel to the limbus when you're putting amniotic membrane, not radial sutures like you do in a keratoplasty. So you can put four or six uh, tangential sutures and then you can basically put an onlay graft on top and suture that as well. So this is just to show uh, amniotic membrane graft with tenonoplasty. This is not my own video, it's a borrowed video. And you can see that there's a lot of ischemia in that area, that, which is all pale and white. So you have to resect that entire surface i'll just run this video quickly and you basically resect that whole thing after it starts bleeding then you mobilize the tenons suture it to the limbus like so and then you can cover it with amniotic membrane graft um so that's about the acute management in the late stage basically you're trying to uh, correct the sequelae of the chemical injury which may be either a lip deformation or you can get uh, a vascularized panis which has covered the entire ocular surface, uh, which is basically uh, a limbal stem cell deficiency. And this, of course, can be accompanied by damage to the stroma and intraocular structures. You can get scarring, uh, etc., which again will need some sort of a keratoplasty. And if you have a lot of damage to the goblet cells, you will have dry eyes, for which again you may have to do some sort of uh, surgical treatment, punctal cautery, you may have to do a uh, uh, plan or uh, some other procedure for, for uh, the ocular surface. So if you may have tracheosis, uh, entropion, keratinization, so you may have to do little procedures for that. Uh, if the furnaces have been severe damaged, uh, you may have to reform the furnaces using the, some sort of a mucous membrane or membrane transplantation. And basically the main other management is the management of the limbal stem cell deficiency which can be combined with a, uh, a keratoplasty as well if uh, there is damage to the uh, stroma or endothelium as well. Uh, of course, you have to do therapies to treat inflammation and tear deficiency as may be required. So um, stem cell transplant may be unilateral or bilateral and uh, depending on whether it's a partial or a total limbal stem cell deficiency. And this may or may not be combined with a uh, limbal uh, lamellar keratoplasty or a penetrating keratoplasty uh, with or without an amniotic membrane graft. <clears throat> so I'll just run through some of the stem cell solutions for chronic sequelae of ocular burns. 
why do we get these late, late damage? It's uh, either de decreased year production or delivery. Uh, um, decreased delivery would be because of blockage of the ducts of the lacrimal glands, uh, ocular surface inflammation, um, conjunctivalization of the surface, mechanical injury because of lashes which are uh, in interned or damaged, keratinized lid margin. The, so that works like a sandpaper which is constantly rubbing on the ocular surface causing micro trauma with blinks and recurrent epithelial breakdown can result in stromal melts because of persistent epithelial defects. So when I when you talk about limbal stem cell deficiency, it can be unilateral or bilateral, partial or complete, and the ocular surface can be dry and wet. And all of these will help in our management plan. So this is on the left is an example of a moist LSCD, and on the right is an is a example of a dry limbal stem cell deficiency with keratinization. It's a bone dry ocular surface. So when we talk about stem cells, they are present in the basal epithelium of the limbal palisades of Vogt. And they go through various stages of differentiation through transient amplifying cells, post mitotic cells, and terminally differentiated cells, which become the uh, central and peripheral corneal epithelium. Am I taking too much time? I, uh, can I take another uh, five yes, minutes? Sir. Please go ahead, yeah. sir. Please, please, sir. Please, sir. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. So um, I'm not able to see a timer. That's the reason. Okay. So, um, uh, so. When you have stem cell damage, you need to replace the stem cells. So where can you get the stem cells? You can get them from the same eye, which is a, called an ipsilateral autograft. You can take them from the fellow eye, which is a contralateral autograft. You can take it from a live related donor, which is called a live related allograft. And uh, you can take it from a cadaveric donor, which is a cadaveric allograft. Or you can take it from some other source of uh, stem cells like the oral mucosa or um, even the bone marrow you can, uh, some people are trying to uh, kind of develop stem cells from that for the ocular surface. So when we talk about limbal epithelial transplant, uh, they can be autografts or allografts and ipsilateral or contralateral. Uh, allografts can be cadaveric or live related, like I said. When we're talking about a bilateral limbal stem cell deficiency, you can do either a live related uh, conjunctival limbal allograft uh, where you are taking from a live related donor and uh, you could take from a cadaveric donor, which is a, it could be a keratolimbal allograft. Comet is when you take oral mucosa and um, transplant, grow it in a lab and then transplant it on the ocular surface. Uh, nowadays, we are doing or live, we take limbal tissue, break it up into tiny uh, pieces and then spread it all over the um, surface. The um, And this is has uh, shown a lot of promise and it's essentially replace all the other options um, before, which I mentioned before this. If it is only a partial bilateral limbal stem cell deficiency, one could do a clet in which you take the limbal tissue wherever it is available, say about one clock hour, take it to the lab, you can grow it on a monolayer of amniotic membrane with the appropriate uh, growth factors uh, and over a week or two it grows into a monolayer and then that you transplant that cultivated limbal epithelial uh, on the ocular surface uh, and whichever the areas where the panis is, you can dissect that, leave behind the intact limbal tissue and basically transplant this sheet on the ocular surface. And that uh, is basically a way of expanding the limited resource of uh, limbal tissue that you might have. And of course, if it is very severe bilateral total limbal stem cell deficiency, then uh, finally, if everything else fails, the last resort is a keratoprosthesis in which you have to basically uh, put an artificial cone. So um, when you talk about a unilateral partial kind of a, a limbal stem cell deficiency, which is um, bilateral, then you can do a, a, a sorry, a unilateral uh, a limb, a limb cell deficiency or partial bilateral limb cell cell deficiency, then you can basically take uh, uh, limbal tissue and basically transplant it uh, like an autograft, either from the CMI or from the fellow eye. Uh, and nowadays that has been replaced by SLET, which in which you just take limbal tissue and bits of it all over the ocular surface. And that seems to be working really well. And I'll show you some videos for that. So if it's a very small peripheral limbal stem cell, a partial limbal stem cell deficiency, you can actually just resect it and even put an amniotic membrane. And the re rest of the limbal tissue is able to kind of take care of that area and epithelize it. And you may not need to do a stem cell transplant per se. 
but anything more requires some sort of a limbal epithelial transplant and hopefully a transplanting limbal tissue a trans, a stem cell tissue so this is what we used to originally do which was a conjunctival limbal allograft or an autograft in which we basically take from the uh, healthy eye two sectors of conjunctiva with the limbal tissue and then you on the un unhealthy eye we resect the entire panel and you suture these two uh, strips of Lim limbal conjunctival tissue, conjunctival limbal tissue, and that works very well. And this is what we used to do for a very long time before we had access to uh, um, labs where we could actually grow limbal epithelial tissue. So when this option was available, we started uh, taking a small bit of limbal tissue, growing it in the lab, and then transplanting it in the ocular surface. So this was one such case I managed with Klett in uh, when I was at LB Prasad. So this was a six-year-old boy. Lyme injury, which was nine months old, you can see the left eye is com completely conjunctivalized. There is also some amount of keratinization of the ocular surface, and the other eye is absolutely healthy. So this is the fellow eye. So we took limbal tissue from the fellow eye, cultivated in the lab, and after ten to fourteen days, uh, it was transplanted in the fellow eye. So this is how you take from the fellow eye. You take a limbal biopsy, a small strip of limbal tissue, about one to two clock hours. And then you put it in a transport medium, take it to the lab, take it into small pieces and put it on amniotic membrane, uh, small bits. And this is then grown over one to two weeks and it forms a monolayer like this, which is then uh, transplanted onto the um, injured eye after two weeks. So you are now we are dissecting that entire fibrovascular panel from the uh, affected eye. And we were not able to put a speculum earlier. Now we are able to put the speculum once we open up the conjunctiva. Now the entire panis is removed, like is being shown here. You can see a lot of adhesion there. So once I removed this, I realized that the underlying stroma was quite scarred and thinned out. So I decided to uh, change my plan and also add a deep lamellar keratoplasty um, because it is a six-year-old boy and I, I didn't want the child to go into amblyopia. So I wanted to also visually rehabilitate him. So as you can see, I'm doing a uh, scissor uh, kind of a mm -hmm. formal dissection at this time. This was one of my very early cases. So you can see I'm using a iris repository to kind of do the lamellar dissection, but it did work. I didn't go down to the level of decimates, but we managed to dissect most of the unhealthy stroma. And you can see that the underlying uh, anterior chamber details can be seen, which means that the deeper stroma is okay. And then we took a large diameter uh, conistral calf, took out the SMS membrane and we basically sutured it in place. Uh, from this, I removed the central epithelium and then basically uh, transplanted the, uh, I'm sorry about that, the sheet of amniotic membrane on top, which had the mono layer of cultivated limbal epithelial cells, and we basically tucked it under the edge of the um, uh, resected conjunctiva and stuck it on with the brindle. And you can see uh, we had a dramatic transformation from this to this, and this child actually started seeing reasonably well, and we managed to salvage the ocular surface and vision and prevent this child from going into amblyopia. So SLET is the new kid on the block and this has really made things easy. We don't need access to a lab like this to grow cells and we basically need a small bit of limbal tissue and this is one of my earlier slits where we took a large amount of limbal tissue uh, along with um, uh, from the fellow eye and then in the, we went to the affected eye which had a chemical injury, resected the entire panels, also did a keratoplasty in this particular case and then we transplanted those, uh, broke up that limbal tissue into small bits stuck it onto the amniotic membrane with fibrin glue and then put a bandage contact lens. That's how we do SLEC, which is called simple limbal epithelial transplantation. Okay, so uh, the other option was to do a keratolimbal allograft uh, in which you take a cadaveric donor uh, cornea and then take uh, break it up into four, four pieces and then you kind of transplant that. This has been replaced by cadaveric allosleg in which you just take the limbal tissue from the uh, uh, donor conistral rim. So this patient's, this uh, donor cornea was actually used for keratoplasty and from the rim we took these little bits of limbal uh, palisades and we broke them into small 
bits. And this was a patient with the total limbal stem cell deficiency. We resected the entire panels. So this is essentially useful in patients where we don't have a donor tissue in the fellow eye or the same eye. So you have to basically go to the cadaveric donor or a live-related donor. So in this case, we resected the entire panels, put fibrin glue with amniotic membrane on the surface. And then we took those little bits of uh, limbal tissue, which we took from the corneal button, and we transplanted them on the ocular surface. You see that we're picking up those little bits and sticking them on the ocular surface one by one. And then again, they are stuck with fibrin glue. And then once the fibrin glue is kind of uh, stuck, then you put a bandage contact lens on top. Okay, so you can see this patient, we managed to salvage the ocular surface very nicely. And from that, it came to this kind of a situation and the patient had very good recovery of vision. You can see on the OCT the explant where it was in, uh, Put that area is elevated and then from there the epithelium has grown onto the ocular surface very nicely. So this is just another such case. In a partial limbal stem cell deficiency, we took from the same eye, took a bit of limbal tissue and then broke it up into bits and transferred it into the rest of the ocular surface which had a big pass. I'll just show, share one more case. This was a very interesting 75-year-old female who had come to my clinic with decreased vision, redness, watering both eyes. She had cataract surgery uh, elsewhere and had come to me referred by the local ophthalmologist uh, with uh, intense burning of eyes and her daughter-in-law was instilling drops in eyes and she had she was on Petfort and Loran Penicol eye drops and this is how she was right eye and left eye had large epithelial defects and it was a chemical injury kind of picture uh, which is very unusual after cataract surgery and there was also a lot of anterior chamber inflammation and edema in the cornea. So I was thinking that this could be a Munchausen syndrome by proxy, which is which meant that basically the daughter-in-law was mixing something in the eye drops. Unfortunately, I couldn't get access to those drops. I asked them to bring it, but they were not. They didn't bring it, and they said they discarded the drops. So uh, we stopped all drops, put the patient on preservative-free lubricants, and did um, uh, procedures to heal the surface. So temporary task therapy was done and a bandage contact lens was put in one of the eyes. So you can see the right eye started healing, the epithelial defect almost completely, conjunctiva completely healed and the corneal epithelial defect started contracting. Left eye uh, had an amniotic membrane uh, like this. Mm -hmm. Right eye uh, bandage contact lens was put and it healed very well. Left eye, the amniotic membrane integrated very nicely as you can see, uh, but formed a panis. So right eye was slowly, slowly clearing over time. Eventually, the right eye uh, cleared quite well with some scarring, but left eye developed uh, this kind of a uh, panis because it had developed a stem cell deficiency and there was a persistent epithelial defect inferiorly, as you can see. So I tried to do a repeat AMG with Tarsarefi like this. Right eye was getting better, left healed again uh, with uh, total limbal stem cell deficiency and superficial scarring. So at this point, we decided to kind of uh, uh, rehabilitate the left eye so there was limbal tissue in the fellow eye. So we took some limbal biopsy from the, the right eye. And then uh, because the left eye cornea also had a lot of edema, uh, I realized that the endothelium also had taken a beating. So we decided to a slit with a desec. So you can see there was a big retrocondyl membrane which we took out. And then uh, we resected the entire panis. I put a desec graft inside and on the surface we did a slit just like I'd shown you. So you can see the DC graft is there inside and on the surface, we put an amniotic membrane and then we put these little slit explants and stuck them with fibrin glue and put a bandage contact lens. And you can see over time, slowly, slowly, the cornea started clearing and we managed to get a fairly clear cornea, just like the fellow eye. So this patient actually uh, did very well with the slit along with the DSEC, which is the first reported case of a combination of slit and DSEC and we recently published that. Finally, the last resort for chemical injuries is keratoprosthesis. So this picture on the right is a case of a Boston 1 keratoprosthesis, which can be done if the eye is moist. But if the eye is bone dry, like I had shown you earlier, you have to do a type 2 Boston keratoprosthesis or an LVP keratoprosthesis has been developed by LVP, which is similar. Or you can do an osteoodonto keratoprosthesis. And this is essentially the reserve for total bilateral limbal cell deficiencies where you have tried a slit or a cadaveric live related uh, procedure or it can't be done. And finally, you can go for this kind of a 
uh, keratoprosthesis. It's a high risk procedure, so it's only the last resort. So take home points are basically um, early management is the most important thing. So that if you do a good early management, you have to do lesser uh, late stage management. And even if you do need to do late stage management, like limbal transplants, most of them now have, nowadays have very good results. So unlike earlier, uh, you you can salvage vision in many of these cases. You may require to do multiple procedures, but as long as the intraocular structures are okay, um, stem cell uh, damage can often be treated with the surgical options that we have at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rishi, sir, for uh, extensively covering A to Z of uh, chemical injuries to the eye. Uh, sir, on that note, uh, what will be your tip when, as a holy is coming by, uh, there have been uh, tips for eyes such as maybe avoid synthetic colors, use natural colors instead. I mean, what is your tip that you would like to uh, the young ophthalmologist who is watching this to advise to their uh, patients who are going to celebrate holy? Yeah, so I think, like I mentioned earlier, it's a good idea to go with organic colors. And even if you're using synthetic colors, make sure it, it's from a trusted manufacturer who would take care to ensure that the pH is closer to neutral. Um, if uh, colors do go in, um, you know, avoid throwing colors into the air. So you can recommend that play in a safe way so that you don't have powder going into your eyes. Uh, and um, if in case you do get color into your eye, the first thing you have to do is wash uh, vigorously. Um, avoid wearing contact lenses when you're playing holy in general. I think that's a good idea to, if you have a refractive error, to wear a pair of glasses. That also provides one barrier of protection for your eyes. Um, have uh, maybe if you're playing holy, you can recommend that somebody can have a bottle of saline handy. Uh, they can just buy it and keep it. And if somebody does have an injury, they can wash their eyes with that. They can just open the bottle and do it. But even tap water is fine as the first measure. Um, so I think these few things are the things that they can do, the patients can do at, at their end, uh, and then immediately rush to the nearest clinic if the eye is still red or if you can see a lot of um, particulate matter stuck inside the eye, which you're not able to remove. Now we also have a dynamic geo panel, sir, uh, Dr. Aditya, Dr. Pranesh, Dr. Nikunj, and Dr. Sanduja, comprising of anterior segment as well as orbit and oculoplasty uh, people. Over to you, your panel. Uh, the stage is all yours to ask, sir. Uh, any doubts or any comments? Any so I just wanted to know, like, for um, because in many of these chemical injury or to protect the ocular surface, usually tarsoraphy is preferred. So what is your take on that? Yeah, tarsoraphy is absolutely very, very important, especially if the epithelium is not healing. That is something which especially can be... Especially, I think, in the acute stages, I think, acute it's stage, very important. Yeah, acute stage, whatever you need to make the uh, surface heal, the epithelize, you need to do. You do. So, if just AMG is not working, please, by all means, do a tarsoraphy. Ah. You can do a temporary tarsoraphy uh, also, or if you want to do, like, a permanent tarsoraphy and... Um, and I'll remove that later, that's also perfectly okay. Tarsoraphy do help. You could also just do a Botox tarsoraphy. You can inject uh, Botox in the upper lid and just kind of that helps the lid to kind of come down. That also can be done. Great, great presentation, sir. As if. Thank you. Uh, hi, Rishi, sir. Nikunj here. Uh, sir, uh, your videos are always amazing to watch and there is always some key pointers to learn from. So I I ob uh, observe that, I mean, uh, you are using always a, a wet AMG for all of your cases. So uh, if it is not available, there are dry AMG, dry amniotic membrane also available in the market, which is commercially, you know, easily available than the wet AMG. So do you use that? And what, what is your take on that? Do you recommend using uh, only wet or we can also use dry? I have used it. It doesn't work as well as the wet AMG, and you certainly can't do uh, sled or clet along with it. You can't put anything right. on top of that. So right. if you have to combine those kind of procedures, I don't think it works. But if you don't have access to uh, fresh or wet AMG, then by all means, please use a cryopreserved one. It is better than nothing. Uh, but uh, 
I don't think it's as good. Right. Thank you. Hmm. Rishi sir, uh, when we conducted the code red last time in Diwali, one of the senior panels did uh, insist on banning uh, crackers. Banning the crackers. Uh, is it uh, is it something that we need to think about that for uh, Holi also or can we substitute it with uh, some other things, sir? I mean, totally out of the box and non-scientific, but... I'm, I, I, I am not a proponent for banning any of our festival celebrations because it's part of our culture. And I love playing Holi and I love uh, lighting crackers. I think we just have to take precautions and um, protect your eyes, wear protective eyewear. Nobody's stopping you. You can wear scuba goggles and play Holi. Um, so I, I, I mean, that's a personal decision. Uh, but I don't think you need to stop as long as you uh, are careful about certain things. And um, I think uh, it's not that we get very bad chemical injury with uh, holy colors. Uh, if you if it does go in, if you immediately wash, very rarely do, uh, do will you see like a uh, florid injury to the ocular surface. Like <laughs> they are mildly alkaline and mildly acidic. They are not severely alkaline and acidic. So, so this is something that is only very uh, mild and moderate injuries that we are dealing with, uh, right, sir? Yeah, with holy colors, I don't think you have to worry so much. Yeah. Because if they do go in, you'll immediately go and wash. And water is readily available in a place where you're playing holy, usually. Sir, I have a very basic question yes, regarding the top use of, usage of topicals radio. already highlighted it. I just wanted to clear it once again. So if suppose there yeah. is a limbal to limbal epithelial defect in one case and another case there is like 4 mm by 4 mm epithelial defect with a 1 mm by 1 mm infiltrate as well. So how do we, because a lot of time we do get confusion regarding the usage of, we under treat it because. So we, if it is an acid injury and it's a very small, like a grade one injury where uh, you have a partial epithelial defect, you don't even need to use steroids. It will heal uh, without steroids. Then you may not get a lot of intraocular inflammation. But if it's an alkaline injury, you know that you will have some intraocular inflammation as well. You don't need to give steroids. Um, and if it is uh, a very severe injury, again, you need to give steroids, especially for the first week. I think it's necessary. So you can give a, um, you don't have to give it hourly. Maybe four to six times is good enough. And you need to do, along with that, if you can combine some procedure to, uh, aid the epithelial healing, then you can continue steroids longer. So if you put an amniotic membrane and uh, cover the surface, then you can continue it beyond a week. All right. Yeah. So another uh, just basic doubt for the benefit of the uh, young ophthalmologists. So uh, what what is the maximum uh, adverse effect that you have treated, sir, in holy? Is it uh, any corneal ulcers that can actually happen even in the later stages? What is your take on it? Uh... Yeah, corneal ulcers are they possible. Uh, people get even uh, lacerations because people get very violent in holy. You can get nail injuries. People break eggs on... The wash uh, guns. The one with the propellant guns. Uh, water guns. Yes. Water, water balloons. Water, water balloons. Yeah. yeah. So all of these can cause various kinds of injuries. Uveitis, um, abrasions ulcers, secondary infections, all of that is possible. So, yeah, be prepared for anything in, on holy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so, we have two more uh, presenters, sir. Two case presentations. We would like you to add your comments after the presentation as well. First, I would like to, if there are no more comments from the Yo panel or my co-moderator, we'll move to the next presenter, uh, Dr. Arnav. Sir. Arnav, you are ready with your slides? Yes, sir. Yeah, can we have it? Yeah. You need to go uh, full screen now, maybe. Yes, sir. Are my slides moving, sir? Uh, no, or no, uh, it's not moving. Just to say, it's not even full screen yet, so. Yeah. It, it's moving, but you're not in slideshow. Yeah, yeah now. So it's moving. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, at the outset, I want to thank the entire team of Yossi 
uh, to give me a chance to present my talk today. Uh, lately, uh, honestly, I haven't seen a lot of holy specific injuries. Uh, so my talk will be focused around chemical injuries. Uh, Holi is uh, definitely perhaps the most vibrant festival of India with the colors and uh, sorry, with the colors and music and celebration, which casts a magical aura on everyone, be it young or old. All the streets come alive with joy in different parts of the country as the whole nation celebrates a bountiful harvest and the advent of spring. Sometimes, however, this revelry can be dampened by accidents with inadvertent injuries that can mar the celebrations. The injuries in particular are extremely vulnerable because they are exposed to the elements uh, that are sensitive and a vital organ. Ocular injury usually is chemical in nature, while in Diwali it is thermal or blast in nature. Uh, just basically starting from the uh, do's and don'ts. Here's a list of do's and don'ts that should be strictly followed and should be advised to the patients. Uh, do not use, first thing is do not use toxic chemical colors. Most of the colors that are available in the market today contain hazardous chemicals as uh, Rishi sir told, like um, mercury, asbestos, silica, mica and lead. They are industri basically uh, industrial dyes and alkalis which are incredibly toxic to the human skin and especially the eyes. Their use can cause symptoms like irritation, redness, allergies, and even permanent loss of vision in cases of severe chemical injuries in the eye. Um, the other thing that we can uh, do is uh, wear protective eyewear. Always remember to protect your eyes with uh, protective eyewear like zero power glasses or sunglasses. Also, it is prudent for uh, females to uh, tie their hair and prevent water from dripping directly into the eyes or use a scarf or hat to protect the eyes and face. Uh, it is always advisable not to wear contact lenses. Uh, if the color does get into the eye, it gets deposited in the contact lens and can continue to get leached over a period of time, causing more significant chemical injury. The Inadvertent use of color stained fingers to wear or take off these lenses can also cause similar chemical injury. It is always advisable not to rub the eyes as it can cause uh, corneal abrasions or can damage the cornea. It may also lead to severe eye infections and other complications. However, if such an injury occurs, it is prudent to first wash your hands with uh, soap and then uh, wash the eyes with a gentle stream of water to irrigate the eye and uh, to this uh, print to wash off the color first before seeking any medical help. Uh, one thing that we come across every single day is patients uh, uh, self medicate themselves. This should be strictly prohibited. Over the counter medicine should not be. Um, I couldn't say it should not be allowed, but as far as possible, patients should be educated not to use them. In case of an eye injury, it is best possible to seek the help of an eye care professional. Usually, most hospitals and clinics are geared to take uh, these injuries uh, promptly on different festivals. All eye drops are not, not the same and sometimes using the wrong eye drop like a steroid or something in a particular case can cause more damage than good. Uh, coming to one a major region, a major uh, thing that I've seen uh, in the last few years is use of water balloons. I remember seeing a patient with a large sphincter tear and uh, macular hemorrhage uh, with just water balloon. He was sitting in a bus and a random person threw water balloon on his eyes and he had uh, uh, he was finger counting in few seconds. Water balloon causes severe uh, impact injury, which can damage the eyes permanently. The impact from the water balloon can lead to bleeding eyes, lens dislocation, and even retinal detachment. It is the most common type of ocular trauma, uh, which can cause high fema, lens subluxation, edema, uh, retinal detachment, leading to loss of vision, rupture of blood vessels, uh, fracture, or even bruising. So basically, if after an injury occurs, what does what happens is the healing of the corneal epithelium on stroma. Uh, the centripetal movement of cells from peripheral cornea and limbers occurs towards the center. Limbal stem cells, as beautifully illustrated by Rishi sir, uh, restores the functional corneal epithelial cells after injury. Damaged stromal collagen is also phagocytosed by keratocytes and the new collagen is synthesized, which helps in healing. Uh, usually when the patient uh, presents uh, in the OPD is with pain, epiphora, blepharospasm, reduced visual acuity, or even uh, corneal ulceration if it's a, uh, within a few days. Uh, what can be done? Uh, 
uh, when the patient presents to us is identifying the severity and also grading the pH of the chemical used, concentration, uh, the duration of contact that was there, uh, area of contact, inherent toxicity of the chemical, what was the impact force, what was the temperature of the chemical, volume, uh, was it uh, contained in a container or if any irrigation was done. Uh, depending on uh, various structures, <clears throat> It can involve the lid causing edema, dermatitis, ulcer, uh, which is the immediate and delayed being secretorial entropion. Conjunctiva can be chemosed, uh, they can be an ulcer uh, or chemosis. Uh, in late stages, it can lead to a simlifron formation, xerosis or perforation. Cornea uh, can uh, have an ulceration or corneal edema. On, or, or in delayed stages or uh, in severe injuries, maybe perforation, vascularized opacities or xerosis. Uvia, um, anterior uveitis is a very common finding or iodocyclitis, traumatic iodocyclitis, uh, atrophic pulpi. Uh, the IOP can be increased initially due to iritis and in late stages due to fibrosis. So basically the goals of management is remove first the offending agent, uh, promoting ocular surface healing, control inflammation, support of the reparative process and prevention of complications. Uh, it can be an immediate or uh, emergency management or an early acute phase management, intermediate or late rehabilitation. Immediate involves checking the pH uh, and uh, we should make sure that we are uh, irrigating and uh, neutralizing it to the physiological range. Uh, always we should make sure that the phonices are checked by doing double aversion. Uh, remove any particulate matter of the holy colors or uh, any other substance that was used. Even a lot of uh, people use silver uh, uh, shining polishes and uh, like uh, eggs uh, on holy. Uh, always, always, always stain the cornea with fluorescein and uh, try to identify any uh, occult or evident uh, epithelial defects. Also make sure that you check the intraocular pressure. So one of the most common and one of the most uh, easily done uh, management techniques is copious irrigation immediately at the scene of accident. Patient should ideally be seated upright, head supported and tilted to the affected side. Eyelids hold uh, head open manually or with a specular. Topical anesthetic should, uh, before irrigation, improves the patient comfort and the uh, cooperation during the procedure. And uh, make sure that uh, you cover the non-injured eye. Otherwise, sometimes you can have dripping towards the non-injured eye as well. Irrigating fluid is an administered uh, nasal to lateral away from the non-injured eye. And during irrigation, patients should be asked to bring frequently and to look in all directions so that uh, we make sure that all the conjunctival sacs are irrigated. Dr. Arnav, sorry to interrupt. Can you like wind up, please? We have another presenter. Yes, sir. Here. Yes, sir. So this is just the image. Uh, standard treatment includes uh, steroids, uh, mild to moderate four times. Uh, uh, then we can use medoxyprogesterone, uh, sodium citrate 10% eye drops or calcium chelator eye drops. Uh, this significantly reduces the incidence of corneal ulceration. Uh, the lubricants, lubricants like uh, are focusing on preservative free, which provides comfort and facilitates corneal epithelial migration. Also, we can use ascorbic acid. Uh, vitamin C tablets are very helpful in the initial phase of healing. Doxycycline uh, tablets about 100 milligram uh, for two weeks, uh, twice a day. Acetyl cysteine 10 percent uh, uh, promotes the anticollagenase activity, which is also found very helpful. Uh, adjuvant therapy can be given with the help of uh, moxifloxacin uh, eye drops or uh, any other antibiotic of choice. Uh, acetosolamide, if at all, uh, we have high intraocular pressure, and cycloplegics also play a major role during pain. Uh, then com coming to the biological substances, autologous serum, platelet-rich plasma, or amniotic membrane can be uh, used in uh, cases with severe ulceration or uh, uh, stem cell deficiency. Bandage contact lens provide a huge support to the patients in the initial phases of healing. Surgically, uh, debridement is one of the options of the depriding the necrotic epithelium or uh, also uh, with uh, the more sophisticated techniques like slit. Uh, follow up severe burns should initially be followed up daily and consider uh, inpatient admission for better compliance. Once it starts to heal, patient is uh, uh, followed up at maybe one week, one month apart. 
And long-term monitoring should always be done in these patients for uh, damage to the cornea, corneal epithelium, stromal involvement, lid involvement, which would, uh, in the form of ectropion, entropion, phonicial shortening, simlifron scarring, etc. Um, at the end, I would uh, uh, ask everyone to celebrate and say, promote a safe and eco-friendly holy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karna, uh, for uh, again uh, just summarizing the salient points of uh, uh, history taking examination and uh, what to do, what not to do. Uh, we'll have the next case present presentation as well, followed by the case discussion at the end by the U panel and as well as by Rishi, sir. So, uh, Dr. Krit Kritika, yes, are you ready? Yeah, yes, you can share your screen. Yes, sir. So first of all, I would like to thank Yossi team for giving me this chance to present a case which I have seen through my emergency duty. So it was an eight years old male patient, sudden diminution of vision in the right eye associated with the burning sensation, pain, foreign body sensation since two hours following the carbide done blast injury. And for which uh, after his parents washed his eyes with the water and reported to the hospital. There was no history of bleeding from the eyes, ENT bleed, loss of consciousness, headache, vomiting, any long-term medication. The past history was not significant, family history not significant, personal history was not significant. General examination was within normal limits, systemic examination was within normal limits. Coming to binocular examination, head posture was normal, position of eyeball central, lacrimal passage, roplast negative. Right eye examination, the uh, vision of the right eye was counting a uh, hand movement positive, PR accurate. Leads were swollen with the multiple white color particles, 1 to 2 mm size, present at tarsal plate. Our battle rim not appreciable due to swelling. Extraocular movements were cool and present in all cardinal gazes. Conjunctiva was congested, chemoth, multiple white color particles around 10 to 15 in number were present at 3 to 5 o'clock position. To 5 to 6 particles were of the size 2 to 3 mm while the rest of them were of the 1 to 2 mm size. The conjunctival planching was present from 7 o'clock to 4 o'clock position, which was suggestive of the limbal ischemia. Now, the palpable conjunctiva was congested. Few foreign body particles were seen, 5 to 6 in number, white in color, 2 to 3 mm in size. Pornasis, foreign body particles were present, 3 to 4 in number, 1 to 2 mm in size, white in color. The cornea epithelial defect around the size of 9 to 8 mm was present. Central paracentral full thickness stromal edema, corneal haze was present in the superior two third of the cornea, extending from 8 o'clock to 4 o'clock position. And sensations were reduced in all quadrants. FS10 was positive in superior two third of the cornea from 8 to 4 o'clock position of the size 8 mm to 9 mm. The left eye examination was absolutely within normal limits. The iris color pattern of the right eye was not appreciable due to stromal corneal haze. Pupil details and lens details were not appreciable. IOP was digitally raised. Fundus examination of right eye was not appreciable due to stromal corneal haze. Left eye was within normal limit. So the clinical diagnosis is grade 4 chemical injury according to Hudges classification modified ball and Rupert Hall classification. Left eye was within normal limits. Investigations were done were within normal limits. USD disc scan of right eye was within normal limits. So the treatment started was irrigation with the one liter of the aisle was done for an hour. It is done for removal of the inflammatory substance and neutralization. The steropurna cocktail, which contains the prednisolone, which was started for seven days. After seven days, steroid was stopped, which decreases the inflammatory cell infiltration and stabilizes the PMNs and lysosomal membrane. Tablet doxycycline 50 MGPT was given for 14 days. It has an antibiotic effect, inhibits the metallo matrix metalloproteinases. Tablet LIMC, which is ascorbic acid 500 MG TDS, which was given for 15 days. It's a cofactor in collagen synthesis. It reduces the chances of ulceration. Hydrop moxipd, moxifloxacin plus prednisolone was started. Antibiotic reduces the chances of secondary infection, while the prednisolone reduces the inflammation. Homide 2 positive TDS was given to prevent the cyanic formation. The IOTM video was given, which contains stimulon, a trabecular mesh for obstruction by debris, and the inflammatory material causes the raised IOP, and this IOP raised was controlled by stimulon. The CMC is the lubrication. 
After two weeks, the slit, simple limbal epithelial transplantation and the AMG grafting with the BCL was done. First of all, we underwent a debridement. Then AMG was glued on the debrided area. Then limbal stem cell graft was taken from the contralateral eye, was cut into pieces and glued in the different clockers and followed by BCL. So before slit, the picture was this. After slit, the vision was counting finger at three feet. PR was accurate. So coming to conclusion, chemical injuries. Preserve the windows to your soul. Shield your eyes from citing the chemicals. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pritika. Um, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Your comments, sir, uh, before we move to the your panel. Uh, uh, lovely presentations, both of you. And um, regarding Kritika's case, you have done this slit after how long after the chemical injury? I think I missed that. How many uh, weeks? Sir, after two weeks. Two weeks, sir. After two weeks, okay. Yes, sir. And what was the indication to do it at two weeks? So he was having the corneal opacity and the visual acuity was quite less. So we underwent a degradation. So the thing is, uh, in the acute stage, slit is probably not a good idea unless the epithelium is not healing. Yes. Suppose you have a non healing epithelial defect, which is uh, like a large persistent epithelial defect and your epithelium is just not closing. Those cases, I think it's a good idea to do a cadaveric yellow slit in which you take from a donor button like I showed you, take limbal tissue, just put it there. It helps the epithelium to close, uh, which yes. is what you need in the stage or in the early stage. Um, mm. What happens in many of these cases is this opacity that you saw with time as the epithelium turns over, it may not be as visually significant. So you should have given enough time for the surface to heal, in my opinion. So maybe uh, a low, low dose steroids, uh, um, copious lubrication, and just observe how the surface heals. Uh, with time, uh, most of the opacity might actually have gone away and you may have, even if you had opacity which is off center and the visual access was reasonably clear, you may have gotten away without doing any other procedure. Yes. Sir. So I don't, uh, in the acute stage or the early stage, uh, you need to do um, slit unless the epithelium is not healed. Yes, sir, sure, sir. I keep that in mind. Thank you, sir. Oyo panel, uh, Dr. Nikunj, Dr. Aditya, Dr. Pranesh, you want to add something yeah. to Sindhu? Yeah, so, hello. Yes, Dr. Aditya, please tell. Yeah, so, hi Rishi, fantastic presentation. Nice to see you. And uh, regarding the second case, the carbide gun injury, I do agree with Dr. Rishi here that it is probably too early to do slit in the acute phase. There is, if I remember correctly, some published literature by Dr. Geeta regarding the role of acute slit in chemical injury. But that, if I remember, the inclusion criteria was grade 6, very the most severe of chemical injuries in the DUA classification. And it's not currently the accepted norm that to go ahead with slit so early. There is always epithelial and stromal remodeling which occurs after any form of insult to the cornea be it a healing corneal ulcer or a healing chemical injury or a thermal burn. So it's prudent to wait and watch, see how the stroma behaves. And like maybe six months down the line, if you're sure the eye is now quiet and no more remodeling is going to occur, you may go ahead with either a slit to clear up the surface or combine it with a lamellar or a full thickness corneal transplant. Uh, two, three important pointers in any form of chemical injury is uh, never un underestimate the role of fluorescent staining. But before you directly apply stain to the surface, just take a quick look. Uh, try and document it if you have access to photography. Because sometimes once you stain the surface, it's difficult to find out whether there is an infiltrate. I think Dr. Dipanshu was asking about that. That if you see epithelial defect with the infiltrate, uh, what would you do about the steroids? Mm -hmm. So the thing here is uh, to determine whether the infiltrate is infective or uh, more likely sterile. So if you're seeing a, a delayed chemical injury patient who has presented you not immediately after the injury, maybe seven days or 10 days down the line, sometimes the persistent epithelial defect will lead to a certain kind of a haze or infiltrate in the stroma, which may look like it's infective, but it's not. But it's always tricky. You may always take a second opinion from your cornea friend or a cornea colleague if they're available nearby. 
to actually determine if the infiltrate is sterile or infected and then go about with your topical steroid therapy. So stain is always beneficial, but take a quick look at the surface, rule out any infiltrate and then stain because staining completely obscures all the details well below into the stromas. You can't really make out if there is any infiltrate or not. Tarsorefe is probably the most underutilized tool we have in our disposal, both for ornea specialists and uh, general ophthalmologists. It, has, it works wonders uh, and has a lot of many eyes by mechanisms which are still not very clear, but it just works. Especially in pediatric patients who may have a tendency to, you know, poke their eyes or try and remove the amniotic membrane or any suture you have put inside. So, if especially dealing with a pediatric patient, you may very well do a tarsor FE at the end when you are especially doing a AMT or any other procedure. So, so just so that they don't poke and remove anything from, try and remove anything from their eyes. And uh, the last point I would like to make is blanching versus ischemia. So, conjunctival blanching and limbal ischemia, scleral ischemia. So, we still don't have a very good clinical tool which can precisely tell us uh, whether you are what you are looking the whitening on the surface is actually just simple innocent blanching or something more sinister like scleral ischemia in which the prognostication and the management would be completely different and in the evolution like dr rishi has shown in his slide the evolution of an injury over time sometimes what you feel is ischemia on the first day may actually very well be blanching and the thing resolves without doing anything much. But if you assume the reverse and miss out on scleral ischemia, then you rapidly see the cycle of melting and perforation. So maybe, yeah, there are again articles talking about angiography, anterior segment angiography in the role of assessment of ischemia versus blanching, but they're not easily available and not accessible to all. So again, Always take seek help, take opinion from an experienced cornea colleague of yours or a friend who have see, who see these cases regularly, just so that you don't under treat when the actual treatment needed is stenon plus T, which again like tarsorephy, a very highly globe saving procedure. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Aditya. Dr. Pranesh, Dr. Nikunj. Anything you want to add? Uh, I just wanted to discuss with and also ask Dr. Rishi sir that, uh, sir, apart from steroids, uh, uh, do you feel the need of any other like anti-inflammatory molecule like cyclosporine or something when you are actually uh, observing the patient and waiting for the slack? I mean, if somebody has a non-healing epithelial defect and uh, you uh, rather than jumping to the slide, do we change medical management first or just continue with the steroids and wait? So, cyclosporin has a role if there is some continuing inflammation. And uh, in the acute stage, there is no role for cyclosporin. Right, in absolutely. The late absolutely. stage, you have some sort of... Um, so, rather than continuing on a steroid long time. Okay. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, so you can give cyclosporin, when, especially uh, if the patient is having uh, an inflamed ocular surface, you're getting a lot of papillary reaction, you're seeing... Um, it's certainly reasonable to do that because uh, there will be a lot of inflammatory mediators in the uh, tears which can um, ca cause other detrimental effects. So it, you could use it, but I don't think it uh, has a proven role. More important is uh, replacement of tears and removal of other factors which are triggering the inflammation. Right, sir. So I have a basic question. Like very commonly we see... Uh lot of uh, ointments being used in the night like steroid ointments or maybe lubricating ointments how like do we should we use them or is it not required in the night the ointments are uh, fabulous actually because they work for a long period of time so if you want a prolonged delivery of any drug ointments are better than drops i use a lot of ointments myself uh, especially lubricant ointments like Say, for example, I use a brand name Lacry Gel. They are preservative free. Most ointments, lubricant ointments are preservative free. So uh, they are easier on the ocular surface and they stay for a longer period of time. So you can certainly use them. And uh, even steroid ointments, I use a lot of steroid ointments uh, in my graft cases. I use them for severe VKC because they will work all night. 
so it's perfectly okay to use oil beans yeah so what is your point of view on the other salts like uh, uh, paraffin uh, mi- mineral oil uh, aquilupian all the all these ointments how how are they different from the oil are good for, yeah the ones which have oil are good for patients with evaporative dry eye yes uh, in fact they are the ointment of choice you want yes. some sort of replacement of the oil so we have a drop now which has oil in it sustain complete so yes. before that we only use these ointments you can certainly use them but they tend to sting sometimes so not everybody tolerates them very well you will have to just see if they are comfortable for the patient then certainly they are good for long standing yeah. uh, or a patient with a chemical injury it's it's viable to use yes why not sure yeah especially if they have a persistent epithelial defect it's a good idea i, I you could give them even more frequently oil based right. more than just at Yes, uh, Dr. Aditya. Yeah. So just to add to the ointment discussion, just be careful when prescribing ointments which contain vitamin A. So that is a photosensitizer which you would like to avoid in patients who are already having some form of ocular surface disease, be it secondary to chemical injury or they are having dry eye or any other, basically any form of OSD, do not prescribe ointments which have vitamin A in them because that will just worsen the OSD more. agree we were using it for a while for mid margin keratinization but it was causing a lot of uh, discomfort to the patients so yeah. discontinued i think ajanta had one yeah yeah five flowers yeah yeah thank you uh, thank you rishi sir uh, thank you all the yo panel uh, do we have any more questions for sir uh, sir do you want to add any a uh, closing comment uh, for the young ophthalmologists of uc who are watching this i think uh, i i've got to congratulate you guys because you're uh, really doing a lot for the young ophthalmologists which is um, you know it's a totally different audience compared to the comprehensive ophthalmologist uh, you have a totally different um, mindset plus a, a, a requirement and i think uh, you you guys are doing targeted stuff for that and um, kudos for that for example something like this most of the emergencies in most of the medical colleges and hospitals are manned by young ophthalmologists so i think this is very relevant and uh, good job it's a holiday yeah. day and uh, the yours will be posted in the casual meeting the idea behind starting the series was also that only sir so that they can have a quick look, look at the videos and they can probably manage it better yes even at that moment if yeah. they need to is a short 4 to 5 minutes video actually so they can have a quick look thank you thank you rishi sir once again and thank you your panel with that we'll move to the last agenda the vote of thanks so uh, first we would, we would like to extend <clears throat> to our uc uh, governing council starting from the president dr sonal kalia digvijay immediate past president our secretary uh, vice president uh, divakan mishra dr karan bhatia dr avinash and dr nilesh and uh, a big thank you to uh, dr rishi swarup sir uh, for joining us today and sharing your uh, valuable inputs on ocular surface diseases not only holy but a to z of all the ocular surface diseases thank you once again sir for spending your valuable time and being with us from the starting till the ending of this particular webinar which really benefited many people and the recording is there on youtube and it, this is going to be as an archive for many years for the days to come and uh, i would also extend uh, our thanks to the case presenters dr arnav and dr prithika so uh, a wonderful coverage of focal points followed by a case by dr prithika and uh, by dr arnav respectively and i would also like to thank uh, my co moderator uh, dr deepanshu and myself who are also part of the executive team of uc and the yo panel uh, comprising of dr aditya dr pranesh dr nikunj and dr sindhuja for uh, contributing your valuable inputs on each and every aspect of uh, ophthalmology be it from orbit ocular surface cornea conjunctiva etc and last but not the least the big shout out to our uc ocular emergency team uh, comprising of arthi hida dr dipanshu once again uh, dr kaushik tripathi dr dr anujit paul and myself I think uh, all of us especially uh, dr arthi dr kaushik dr anuj who are also here part of the team 
spent a lot of uh, background effort in getting each and every small, small thing done. Be it the Zoom link, the flyer, connecting with the people, getting the cases. And I think that completed uh, the day for us today. Uh, so thanks to the team of Pi once again and as also the attendees who are attending. So uh, uh, apologies if I miss somebody, but uh, thank you, dear all. Thank you. We would like to close the session. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.